Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with permission, I'd like to make a statement on exiting the European Union. We've now had three days of debate on the withdrawal agreement, setting out the terms of our departure from the EU and the political declaration setting out our future relationship after we have left. I've listened very carefully to what has been said in this chamber and out of it. <laughs> to what has been said in this chamber and out of it by members from all sides. From listening to those views, it is clear that while there is broad support for many of the key aspects of the deal, on one issue, on one issue, the Northern Ireland backstop, there remains widespread and deep concern. As a result, if we went ahead and held the vote tomorrow, the deal would be rejected by a significant margin. We will therefore defer the vote schedule for tomorrow and not proceed to divide the House at this time. I set out in my speech opening the debate last week the reasons why the backstop is a necessary guarantee to the people of Northern Ireland and why, whatever future relationship you want, there is no deal available that does not include the backstop. Behind all those arguments are some inescapable facts. The fact that Northern Ireland shares a land border with another sovereign state. The fact, the fact that the hard-won peace the fact that the hard-won peace that has been built in Northern Ireland over the last two decades has been built around a seamless border, and the fact that Brexit will create a wholly new situation. On the 30th of March, the Northern Ireland-Ireland border will for the first time become the external frontier of the European Union's single market and customs union. The challenge the challenge this poses must be met, not with rhetoric, but with real and workable solutions. Businesses operate across that border. People live their lives crossing and recrossing it every day. I've been there and spoken to some of those people. They do not want their everyday lives to change as a result of the decision we have taken. They do not want a return to our hard border. And if this House cares about preserving our union, it must listen to those people, because our union will only endure with their consent. We had hoped that the changes we have secured to the backstop would reassure members that we could never be trapped in it indefinitely. I hope the House will forgive me if I take a moment to remind it of those changes. The customs element of the backstop is now UK-wide. It no longer splits our country into two customs territories. This also means that the backstop is now an uncomfortable arrangement for the EU, so they won't want it to come into use or persist for long if it does. Both sides are now legally committed to using best endeavours to have our new relationship in place before the end of the implementation period, ensuring the backstop is never used. If our new relationship isn't ready, we can now choose to extend the implementation period further reducing the likelihood of the backstop coming into use. If the backstop ever does come into use, we now don't have to get the new relationship in place to get out of it. Alternative arrangements that make use of technology could be put in place instead. The treaty, the treaty is now clear that the backstop can only ever be temporary, and there is now a termination clause. But I, but I am clear. What I, from what I have heard in this place and from my own conversations, that these elements do not offer a sufficient number of colleagues the reassurance that they need. <laughs> I spoke to a number of EU leaders over the weekend, and in advance of the European Council, I will go to see my counterparts in other member states and the leadership of the Council and the Commission. I will discuss with them the clear concerns that this House has expressed. We are also looking closely at new ways of empowering the House of Commons to ensure that any provision for a backstop has democratic legitimacy and to enable the House to place its own obligations on the government to enable the House to place its own obligations on the government to ensure that the backstop cannot be in place indefinitely. Mr Speaker, having spent the best part of two years poring over the detail of Brexit, listening to the public's ambitions and, yes, their fears too, 
and testing the limits of what the other side is prepared to accept, I'm in absolutely no doubt that this deal is the right one. It honours the result of the referendum. It pre- Order. The remainder of the statement must be heard, and I invite the House to hear it with courtesy, and for the avoidance of doubt and also the benefit of those attending to our proceedings who are not <laughs> members of the House, I emphasise that, as per usual, I will call everyone who wants to question the Prime Minister. But meanwhile, please hear her. The Prime Minister. It honours the result of the referendum, it protects jobs, security and our union, but it also represents the very best deal that is actually negotiable with the EU. I believe in it, as do many members of this House, and I still believe there is a majority to be won in this House in support of it if I can secure additional reassurance on the question of the backstop, and that is what my focus will be in the days ahead. But, Mr Speaker, if you take a step back, it is clear that this House faces a much more fundamental question. Does this House want to deliver Brexit? (laughs) And uh, a a clear message from the SNP, but if the House does, Does it want to do so through reaching an agreement with the EU? If the answer is yes, and I believe that is the answer of the majority of this House, then we all have to ask ourselves whether we are prepared to make a compromise, because there will be no enduring and successful Brexit without some compromise on both sides of the debate.